Hi, I'm Jess Engelking. I'm the store manager at Soundings Fine Audio, and today we're going to be doing an overview of speaker types. So speakers make up the ultimate character of your system. If you don't like your speakers, there's not a lot that we can do to improve their voicing. Um, a lot of speakers have their own kind of characteristics, the way that they will handle horns or female voices, male voices, drums, bass, um, all of those different sound types. Some speakers do better than others when it comes to producing different parts of the frequency range. So choosing the right speaker at the beginning is crucial to making sure that you really like your whole stereo system. So the, the main speaker types that are out there, we're, we're going to keep it pretty basic for this video. Um, you're going to have bookshelf speakers or stand mounted monitors, some people call them, but basically smaller speaker boxes. You'll have larger tower speakers, which will sit on the floor. You don't need any type of stand or shelving for those. If we're talking about surround sound, you might have a center channel speaker. And then there are also subwoofers that will handle the low end that your speaker may not be able to do on its own. There are specialty speakers out there as well. You may have a speaker that has its own amplifier. It may not need anything else. It has a lot of those parts built into the speaker box. There are also custom integration speakers. We call them CI speakers for short. Those may be actually in the wall. You'll cut a hole and mount it to the wall itself. Um, or maybe an on-wall speaker. Um, some different types of installations just to beautify things will give you all kinds of different options to make sure that it's not just a box sitting out in the middle of the room. One of the most basic things when it comes to a speaker is you'll see the two-way, three-way, four-way iterations and you'll see that on the specification or in the description of the speaker a lot of times. And what they're talking about is just how many times are the frequencies divided up. So if we have all the sounds that we can hear, all the high highs and the low lows, you it's pretty difficult to get all of those sounds to come out of one specific speaker. So what they'll do is they'll divide it up so that the highs are handled by the tweeter and maybe everything else is handled by a woofer. Or maybe you want to get more bass and they'll take the what the woofer is doing and divide that up again so that the lowest frequencies kind of have their own lane. You'll have a piece on the inside of the box called the crossover. It's kind of like the traffic cop for all of the frequencies that are going through there, all the different sounds. It makes sure that only the highs are played for, through the tweeter, that only the bass is going through the woofer. Because the woofers just aren't designed to play the highest frequencies in most cases, and most tweeters will blow up if you try to get them to play what the woofer is trying to do. So there are lots of different technical specifications that you'll see on a spec sheet. I'm just going to go out there and say that a lot of this is designed for marketing. That doesn't mean that they're not useful, but you really got to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. Uh, the most egregious of this is going to be the frequency range. So you'll see things that'll say 40 hertz to 20,000 hertz or 80 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. This is the, the lower number represents the base. You know, the higher or bigger number represents the high frequencies. We're very sensitive in a middle kind of range, say 1,000 to 4,000 hertz. That's where a lot of vocal uh, frequencies are. Uh, to give you a reference point, 50 hertz is a kick drum. So when you hear that, that thump of a drum and someone's really slamming on that bass pedal, um, that's really only 50 hertz. And so you'll see speakers that will say that they play into the 30s, into the 20s. But those low, low frequencies are a real moving target because there are a lot of factors in how you get that. We don't know how they measured it. There are special rooms called anechoic chambers where you can see what a speaker can do in kind of a scientific setting. But when you put it in a room, whether it's a small room or a big room, will have a big effect on whether or not you can actually get some of those low, low notes. If the speaker is placed against the wall or if it's out in the room, that will also affect it. So you can't really go completely off of what those numbers are. It's more of a guide. So know that you'll probably be plus or minus what those lower ranges are. On the high end, the 20,000 Hertz, that's really, really high. For men especially, our high frequency range starts to roll off as we age, and many of us aren't going to be able to hear beyond 15,000 hertz anyway. We have a lot of companies, though, that have figured out through psychoacoustics, not just the what our ears do, but what our brain actually does with the sound and what our bodies do, we actually take in sound more than just through our ears. When we, when we feel that bass, those are low notes that we may not be able to actually take in through our ear, but our body knows that that's happening. The same thing can happen with the high frequencies as well. So you can use this frequency response as a guide to tell you how much of the original track will actually be there. 
In the recording industry, the standard for frequency range is 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. And that is basically accepted as the amount, the, the amount of hearing range that most people have on a good day. In reality, we're a little bit less than that. But if you have a speaker that could theoretically do 20 to 20, we would refer to that as a true full range speaker. If you had a speaker system that could reproduce that, you can feasibly hear everything that was on an original recording. There's some exceptions to this. You'll hear some sub bass systems. So I just got back from a trade show where they showed off a giant 60 inch subwoofer. And most of us would say, well, 60 inches isn't, isn't going to fit in the living room. And that's, that's true. It's really designed for more professional locations, you know, giant theaters or maybe a, a custom home theater for a large house. But that's designed to produce these really low undulating sounds to give us that feeling of deep, deep bass. It also produces extra harmonics that actually do creep up into the hearing range. Another major specification is sensitivity. This is something that is also has kind of a fudge factor when it comes to marketing. You'll see sometimes one watt at one meter. Sometimes they'll say, you know, 2.83 volts. That kind of matters because that tells you how much power they're actually putting into the speaker. But if we put that aside for a minute, essentially that will tell you if you put roughly one watt of power into a speaker, how much sound you can expect to get back. So at one watt, one meter, if you see 85 decibels or 90 decibels, that is the volume that you would expect that speaker to produce at a little over three feet away. 90 decibels is a lot. That's, that's concert level volumes. You can actually get an extra 3 dB of volume every time you double the power. So if you had a 90 dB efficient speaker, for example, at one watt, one meter, at two watts, you get 93 dB. At four watts, you get 96. At eight watts, you get 99 decibels of sound and so on as you add power. This shows why power may not be the ultimate thing to look for when you're trying to pair an amplifier with a speaker. Most people are using less than five watts most of the time when they're listening to a piece of music. Uh, the, the sensitivity is going to be a good guide to let you know how much horsepower you really need. There are other factors. So if you sit further away, if your room is really large, those are all factors that will help you know or help you determine how big of an amplifier you really need to play the music you want at the volume you want with the frequencies your music have. All of these puzzle pieces work together to finally design your full your full system. It's something that that we it's a service we provide here at Soundings to help make sure that everything kind of matches up. One of my favorite amplifiers in the store is actually a 12 watt amplifier and it will power some really good sized speakers to some pretty high volumes. Again, if you keep this math problem in mind, you can you can get away with all kinds of stuff. The reason you'd want to do a higher power amplifier has more to do with the distortion that the amplifier creates because your speaker is going to play back the music, but any distortion that comes through the signal is also going to be put through the speaker as well. So we want to, again, use all of these different specifications to help guide us. Not It's not a set in stone type of thing, but we use this to guide us to the right path. So this kind of wraps up some of the basics that we will go over with speakers. There are definitely more things that we can go into. There are definitely more parts inside a tweeter and a woofer and the cabinet that affect the sound quality. But today we just kind of wanted to go over the basics. We'll have another video coming out about choosing your speaker and how do you actually pick the right speaker for your room, for your amplifier and your particular situation. So that's coming down the pipeline. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe and stay tuned for the next video.